Bien, mesdames et messieurs, je vous souhaite une très cordiale bienvenue au nom de l'Université de Lausanne et de la Fondation Charles Veillon à l'occasion de la remise du prix européen de l'essai, du 41e prix européen Charles Veillon de l'essai à Siri Ursved qui a été remis hier soir en ville de Lausanne. Euh, L'affluence en fait, de, 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 de personnes dans cette salle témoigne aussi de, du très grand intérêt que, que vous témoignez à à son travail, à son œuvre. On a décidé finalement d'enlever toutes les tables dans la salle et de mettre des chaises. On a bien fait. Um, donc, uh, I will now switch to English. So we are very pleased and very honored to welcome today Sirius Svet. <laughs> She can understand French, and so we'll be, you will be able to afterwards to ask your questions in, in French if you like. And we'll so have Anna we will, we will translate things if uh, it's needed. And uh, of course, uh, the work of Siri is very important for what, we're, what is the core business and the, the work of the University of Lausanne, which is uh, producing knowledge. And uh, she has produced a lot of very interesting reflections about the way we produce knowledge between disciplines and the way to, to go uh, far away uh, in the, out of the frontiers of the disciplines in order to have a better understanding of our world, our body, and the way we are building societies. So, uh, you know, as you know, the motto of the UNIL is uh, le savoir vivant, the living knowledge, and I think the, the, the work of uh, Sirius Svet is, is a very good way of, uh, you know, uh, making the, 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 the knowledge we produce very, very alive. So, um, we are here today because of the, the prize which was given to her regarding his uh, book, uh, The Delusions of Certainty, and uh, I will now give the floor to Francesco Pan as we we'll introduce the, the next oui, vraiment step. très brièvement parce que le temps est limité. Donc pour entamer ce dialogue, nous avons demandé à Sirius Vett de synthétiser sa thèse si possible, en 180 secondes, il paraît que c'est à la mode. Elle échangera ensuite avec Eleanor Lépinard et Jean-Claude Amazen, puis avec vous bien sûr. L'échange se fera en anglais comme l'a dit Alain, Alain Kaufmann, une traductrice est là, Anna que nous remercions évidemment pour faciliter les prises de parole. Donc la langue n'est pas une barrière. So it's my pleasure to introduce you uh, Eleanor Lépinard. Eleanor is professor of gender studies. She, uh, she dedicates her work to the domain of feminist theories, feminist movements, intersectionality and quotas for gender. Uh, I would say with a special attention to their political, moral, and emotional dimension. And uh, Jean-Claude Jean Amazon, uh, I know that, I'm sure that many of you uh, know his voice, wonderful voice. Uh, Jean-Claude Amazon is a medical doctor, immunologist, director of the Centre d'études du vivant at the Institute, of, at the Institut des Humanités de Paris, Al de l'Université Paris Hydro, French. <laughs> and former president of the Comité Consultatif National d'Éthique Français. And uh, uh, we had the, 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 the great pleasure, pleasure to, hear, to hear him last night for a beautiful laudatio for our laureate. So, dear uh, Siri Uzvet, the floor is now yours for this not so easy exercise <laughs> to synthesize your work in a few minutes. Thank uh, you for being here. No, it's not so easy. So, uh, nevertheless, um, I'm going to try to make this quite short. Um, when I first started writing uh, this text called The Del Delusions of Certainty in English, I asked people at dinner parties and um, in you know, ordinary social circumstances, tell me what you think the mind is. This didn't work very well. <laughs> and then I said, tell me what you think its relation to the body is. And there were different answers to this. Um, and then I asked them if they thought the mind and the brain were identical. Some people did, some people didn't. What became very clear was uh, that we really don't know what we mean when we use the words mind and body. And um, that this has been a question and a problem since the Greeks, uh, that Plato's legacy of the immortal soul had a great effect on Christianity. And of course, all of us here, whether we are Christians or not, are affected by uh, Christianity and Western culture. When I became interested in pursuing the problem of what is now called consciousness, which is, of course, related to mind. 
uh, in cognitive science, cognitive neuroscience, um, I began to realize that in order to understand this, you had to go back to the 17th century, um, where uh, philosophers, natural philosophers, were debating the question uh, in a very lively way. And um, that what ended up being the legacy of the 17th century uh, natural philosophy was, of course, Descartes and Hobbes. Uh, Descartes felt that the mind was a different substance, as we all know, from the body, uh, and Hobbes mechanized everything. Uh, in uh, the theory that I pay close attention to what's now called classical computational theory of mind, I discovered that there was a neo-Cartesian aspect of this. It was always closely tied to artificial intelligence, which meant that it did not matter what material the mind was instantiated in, it could be separated from cellular, uh, uh, cellular material. Um, and the further I went, the more I began to understand that using CCTM uh, produced a number of roadblocks that then resulted in what we now think of as a paradigm change in cognitive science, um, which is now called the movement toward embodiment, or often the four E's. That's a little introduction for something else. Um, and, uh, and, and of course, that underneath all this, I want to say this at the end, is um, an assumption that is, uh, goes all the way back to the Greeks, that we have um, nature, body, woman, culture, mind, man. And part of the impulse in artificial intelligence was, of course, to avoid the reality of the female body, specifically its uh, uh, role in gestation and birth. So, it's not over, right? The problem of consciousness is not solved, and panpsychism goes on. Uh, now it's being revived because people want to understand where is mind and where is matter. And after quantum theory, uh, some people are guessing that it goes all the way down to those mysterious particles. That will do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Siri. Now we're giving the floor to Eleanor. We will give it insight about your work and uh, its, rela its relationship with her work. In, in 180 yeah. seconds as well. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. So it's, a, it's, of course, a pleasure to be here, and I thank you both for uh, the invitation to discuss um, uh, Siri Hutz, that um, essay, which is amazing and, of course, cannot be summarized in a 180 seconds. It's very rich. There's lots of questions, especially for us academics. She, she, she questions us and she challenges us in lots of ways, and I hope we can also talk about this a little bit, about the, the disciplinary boundaries into, in academia and how we produce knowledge. I think those are very, very important questions. But... The question I want to ask first uh, comes from my own background as a, as a gender studies scholar, of course. So as, as she just briefly mentioned, um, the mind-body uh, dilemma uh, plays out in gender very strongly, uh, but also in gender studies. And as you say in the essay, uh, gender studies have contributed to uh, the idea of a difference between nature versus culture, body versus mind, and uh, the, the um, hegemonic or the dominant thinking today in gender studies is that gender is constructed 
So it's an idea of constructivism. So we are men and women. Okay, there might be a little bit of biology in there, but we don't want to think about that. <laughs> what we think about is how society makes us men and women. And you remember Simone de Beauvoir's famous line, you are not born a woman, you become one. Yeah. And it's very important. And, and, and gender studies scholars have been attached, yeah. emotionally attached, yeah. to this idea uh, because they thought that it would be easier to change the world if it was socially constructed. Yeah. If the world is biologically constructed, how are women going to be emancipated from their social roles if they have some ground in biology? And that comes up in other instances in your uh, essay, the fact that we believe that what's in two biology is harder to change or is, is more innate or is unchangeable and mutable. And so my question to you is, if we adopt your perspective, which is uh, not dualist, which is that the body and the mind are one of a kind, the same kind, the thinking body, what kind of change do we have to make in our thinking about social change? So, so how should we rethink the way we want to change society and, of course, issues around gender? <coughs> A big one. Uh, but, uh, no, I think one of the failures um, is the way biology has been framed in gender studies as um, a thing, right? And, and that women and men are, are things as opposed to dynamic beings. And that there, in a very important way, um, the, I think people have to start thinking about the way that culture becomes matter, right? So, you know, just think of simple things, um, memories, we know that memories are also physiological realities and that they are not static, right? So if we begin, I, last night I quoted John Dupre, who I think is a very interesting philosopher of biology. He said, uh, organisms are not things, but processes, okay? One other thing, if we take biology seriously, and I do, I think one of the suppressed aspects of, in Western philosophy, has been birth. A lot of talk about death. I mean, death is everywhere. And think of this, in uh, art, the history of Western art, there are no images of birth until the 20th century. There are two shards from Etruscan vases. Now remember, the Etruscans were not the Greeks that depict a woman giving birth that were found in 2011. Other cultures depict birth as, hello, the beginning of life. Uh, 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 you know, and where do we all begin? Every single one of us, we begin inside a woman's body. And for those of you who are entertaining the fantasy of artificial uteruses, I have done the research, they are not on the horizon. Because in part, embryology is still a working process. I become very interested in the placenta. The placenta, as we know, if you look at look up the the uh, <laughs> the work on the placenta, which is now roaring, but many papers say the placenta, the forgotten organ, the placenta, the ignored organ in embryology. Go and look at past embryological textbooks. It's as, it's as if the placenta just vanished. Now, here is a, a, a temporary organ that appears and then disappears. And they know there, things are happening. It's so interesting, right, that there's cellular exchange between uh, the mother and the fetus orchestrated 
not accidental, orchestrated by the placenta, which means that, in my thinking, that these entities are far more fluid than anyone has wanted to think. Now, what happens after the infant is born, which is different in human life from, say, rats, we know a lot about rats, uh, is that the infant has the capacity to speak every language, but as we know, unlike other mammals, we have many, many languages. So that difference is something that, that should be noted, and it has something to do with species being. And um, I think that this social space that is necessary to all mammals, but is most highly developed in human beings, has a kind of plasticity and possibility that may help explain cultural constructionism through a biological lens as well. Instead of pushing down biology, you say, no, what is it that's interesting about the human species? OK, one other thing. Uh, human beings are born really early, right? If you've ever seen a horse born, a colt, after about a minute, that horse stands up and walks around, right? So it's called neoteny uh, in, in biology. And this means that the f first, I think it's, yeah, it's Gould who says, I mean, he looks up an old German, I can't remember this German uh, 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 biologist, but that the first year of life in human beings is just a post-uterine experience, which, again, is very useful to think about in human beings as opposed to cults, horses. Um, because we need extra gestation, external, outside the womb gestation, which has a lot to do with social development. So if I follow you, yeah. the Swedes, as always, are <laughs> right <laughs> when they design daycare where you, can, you don't name children by he or she, for example, or they can choose how to be named or it can change. So like early development would be a phase we should pay more attention to, I guess, if we want to change the world and to change a little bit. Well, and also world. not to ignore uh, the fact that attachment is really important for human development. You need attachment, right? So there's no, to my mind, there's no... Uh, brain without another brain, right? There's no uh, self without the other. We develop through others, and, and, and that is crucial. And even though other animal studies now are just fascinating, right? You know, the avian brain and the birds are, you know, really amazing, and we have to, like, change our evolutionary ideas. Nevertheless, human beings, as I like to say, we have libraries and rats don't. <laughs> Even though we share a lot with rats, right? And if I can just like uh, continue on the, on the idea of um, relationality that you just mentioned, which is yeah. very, very important in your essay, um, and maybe suggest a connection which I'm not sure you are making explicitly. <laughs> But um, in the essay, um, Siri describes how lots, lots of philosophers like Descartes like to imagine that you know, humans are born adult almost yeah. and uh, without any dependency on others, any attachment, so care is not necessary and doesn't enter through their thinking. And there's a lot of development in feminist ethics of care. There's a lot, I mean, feminist thinkers have been um, trying to change that image of uh, what an ethical and moral life and human life looks like, and, and that it is indeed uh, rooted into dependency and relationality. But there is also some uh, feminist philosopher who argues that the denial of uh, relationality so the idea that we could be autonomous individual, which is at the heart of liberalism, is also rooted in a form of privilege. It's a privilege of ignorance. It's ignoring the others, ignoring 
what they do for you to sustain your life. And so I was wondering if you agree with that connection uh, between denial of relationality and privilege and what's also... Yeah, so, you know, the legacy of, of the Reformation and the Enlightenment is a mixed one, huh? to say the least. Um, but also this idea of autonomy, which is stronger in the West um, than in other cultures, um, is often taken for granted, and it goes on and on, I think, in scientific studies. Um, the idea of singularity, of aloneness, <laughs> of um, uh, and and so I, I yes I agree, there is no uh, life for human beings without others. We are social animals, and uh, and I think to deny that um, is part of the fantasy, and it's often been a masculine fantasy. <laughs> So thank you, both of you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll now give the floor to Jean-Claude Amaisen, who is uh, in his wonderful talks on uh, France Inter every, every Saturday. You, you must be numerous to listen to him each Saturday. is, as you know, talking a lot of, about evolution, neuroscience, and society, and uh, very often citing serious work. So he will now ask some questions to her. So I, yesterday, what I what I think about Siri uh, Hustvet and he, her work, which I think is really fundamental, essential, and very beautiful at the same time. Which means it's it's a, it's a deep pleasure both at the rational level and at the emotional level and at the aesthetic level. Uh, just just a, a remark when you say we have libraries and rats don't have them. Maybe we should give them time because <laughs> modern humans exist since 300,000 years and writing since 5,000 years. So for 295,000 years, we didn't have libraries. <laughs> so this is also something, and, and you're right, we forget temporality in our life as you said, from birth, conception, in or in life, and we, we forget it. And we forget it also on evolutionary terms, which means we, we often think we emerge in today's society with everything that has been yeah. invented and that didn't exist, and that we can think made humans as humans as we are today. So it's strange to think that people that don't write are as human as we are, and so it's and, and so, so it's it's complex always to to how to say to to, to reintegrate a, a, a temporality. I wanted to what, what you said about the placenta is very is very beautiful. I wanted to add something in several species: primates, humans, mice, mm -hmm. every mammal. Uh, placenta uh, allows cells from the child and the mother to interpenetrate by using a retroviral glycoprotein. And so it's di different retrovirus that have infected ancestors of the mice, ancestors of the primates, ancestors of other uh, species that have been integrated in the genome, which means they are, they are part of our genome, and that have been used to create its interaction as if mammals repeatedly have used an infectious process to allow this interpenetration between, which is as an infection, but a, a mutually beneficial infection. So it's really, it's not only between mother and child, it's also between viruses and humans. So it's a, it's a, it's a complex uh, uh, story where the, what, what you are insisting in, in your book and in your thought, where the difference between the inside and the outside is a, is a frontier which is, a, which is always a, 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 a porous yes. frontier, right? Yes. We, which, uh, what is uh, the mind and its relation with body? <laughs> it makes me always think about an, another fundamental question which is unanswered. And I think 
it's nice that this type of question cannot be answered. <laughs> because when you answer, it's like you stop. And the questions are, are what, I mean, what makes us move uh, uh, doing research. The other question is, what is life? Uh, Erwin Schrödinger wrote a beautiful <laughs> book in, in the 40s. What I is life? I love that book. Though. It's a beautiful book. It's a book. wonderful book. And it's a prophetic book, but yeah. it's a strange book. It says us something because Schrödinger was saying to understand, we will say DNA, it didn't exist. Yeah. Uh, to, uh, nobody knew how it was made. To understand the heredity uh, substance, there is a need from a, for a new physics. He thought that physics has had to make big discoveries because with 1940s physics, the science, it was not enough to understand uh, heredity. And he was wrong. It was with the physics of this time that heredity was understood and, and DNA. So sometimes we think that we miss uh, knowledge, fundamental knowledge, and it's not true. It's just that we miss understanding of, of of, uh, of what no, has to be understood. We can't see it, right? right? And, and I mean, last night, one of the things I said, and I've been thinking a lot about this, is that one cannot actually recognize what one can't imagine, mm -hmm. right? So that part of science, part of art, part of every uh, discipline is to, in fact, open avenues for the imagination uh, because you know, the history of knowledge is always locking doors that are later opened. I mean, in What is Life, Schrodinger talks about Lamarck, who he says, it's almost as if Lamarck was right. And in epigenetics now, people are saying, gee, you know, uh, acquired characteristics, it looks as if these can be inherited. And I know you, I mean, you have been working on, mm -hmm. on this. So, and Lamarck became a laughing star, right? And, 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 and uh, you know, a, a, a kind of swear word in biology, just as what I brought up yesterday, vitalism became a swear word. And now there are people saying, well, gee, maybe living things do have, uh, agency in ways that a uh, computer doesn't. You know, it seems kind of obvious to lay people, but when you get down into the philosophical roots of the problem, it's a real problem. What is alive and what is dead? And how do we distinguish them? And the nice part is that in something which we call alive, which is a question of what do we call alive and what, nothing is alive, which means a congregation, a configuration of things who are all inert in some configuration is a life. It's like if we would say, if we could take the components of a cell and put them together and none is alive, if the configuration would be okay, which is a very complex question, the cell will begin to live. So the thing about how, where is the frontier between inert and life is a little bit the same as what is the frontier between a body and a conscious body? Yeah. And what you said, which is uh, 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 very striking yesterday when saying uh, uh, computational uh, 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 cognitive yeah. theory of mind, speaks about abstract processes. Yeah. And abstract processes don't require a particular material, which yeah. means yeah. You, you can, with uh, silicium, make intelligence artificial, which will compute. Now, the interesting thing, if there is a relation, which nobody knows, we know it from, we know what are living things just from seeing them. We, know, we think we know what are conscious yes. bodies, but we don't really know because you, you, you cannot see conscience. You can only, only deduce it or imagine it. Um, we, okay, we know that our bodies are made of cells, which are made of uh, inert components, and that we are conscious. And so the question is, could, could silicium become conscious? If we think, and, and what you allude to, what Darwin thought, what uh, Franz Duval thinks, what Spanx uh, think, that the origin of consciousness is maybe emotion, 
and that emotion is something which links very closely the body to the feeling, mm -hmm. then the question of the, of the relationship with, with the constituents of the body becomes much clearer because it's not an abstract process that any material could do. The question begins, what is a relationship between constituents and feelings and emotion, uh, forgetting everything which is abstract, computational, or, 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 uh, uh, or, or, or in my So it's, it's, it's a way of, of coming, reincarnating closer, what you are doing. Uh, yeah, exactly. Going yeah. closer yeah. to the body without yeah. knowing the answer, right? Right, absolutely. One thing that uh, uh, for the relationship between matter and life, and bodies, or let's say cells, congregation of cells, and consciousness, emotion, and thing. Uh, is a beautiful paper by uh, Philip Anderson, the, the, the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1973, 73, if I remember well, uh, which is called More is Different. And yes. where, <laughs> where he said that, in fact, a congregation of atoms, once they become very numerous and adopt, can adopt certain configuration, will lead to the emergence of entities whose behavior cannot be described from the level be yeah. beyond. Yeah. And so if life, if living things are matter, uh, the problem is not in the constituents of the atoms, it's in the way in which the molecule interact. Consciousness is in the ways the cell which compose us interact, and as you say, in the ways the cell which compose us interact, not inside only in our body, but with the whole world outside. So it's, it's like something that you cannot deduce from, when you were speaking about mechanistic, yeah, you can it's anti-mechanistic thinking. Right, you can decompose, right. but decomposition doesn't tell you how it works at the higher level. Right, exactly. So I, I think basically, fundamentally, you are speaking, even when you don't use the words, you are speaking about emergence. Yes, and so emergence is one of the solutions. And of course, the following question becomes, at what point? Uh, and then we, we don't know, but, but I know, Antonio Damasio in his last book talks exactly about this, that feeling, and he then roots it in nervous system. Very primitive nervous systems. And this may be an avenue uh, uh, to follow and then understanding those emergent processes. And, and as I said, you know, uh, there are other people who say, you know, that's no good. It's we want to go all the way down. Uh, and the other question is, which yeah. I think nobody knows, is what is so special about cells which we call nervous cells? You know, yeah. why is it yeah. always nervous cells and not, and not liver cells? and not skin cells. So what is specially nervous cells that makes when they associate emerging properties that we think do not exist in other congregations? Right, and, right. And, and there is no answer other than description of what the nervous cells are doing, right? But it doesn't exactly. explain. Exactly. We don't have the causal <laughs> or mechanisms or whatever they are. Yeah. Can, I, can I say one thing more? You, you were speaking about the masculine, uh, uh, how to say, notion of autonomy, and I would say the feminine in the most abstract term of solidarity, right? Or, or, or relationship. <laughs> I, I have a, I have it a, is. <laughs> I have a <laughs> quote, I have a quote which I like very much from the, the, the masculine philosopher, French philosopher Paul Ricoeur, which I think bridges both in yeah. saying, uh, I, I uh, if I say it in English, that one enters in ethics when one, in addition to stating his own or her own freedom, states that the freedom of the other should be. I want you to be free. And I think it's an interesting marriage between yeah. freedom and yeah. solidarity, which yes. says that our freedom depends on the freedom and the care of the other. So it's yeah. not an independent freedom, no. it's an interdependent and freedom. Ricoeur is a very attractive thinker for, for me. I've always actually loved reading Ricoeur. Um, the, the, the question here is, of course, if we go back to um, 
culture and, and how it works. And I've been mentioning him again, Pierre Bourdieu, and the idea of habitus, which you can take this idea and biologize it, if you will, through a number of different avenues. Um, and the problem with some of the stereotypic ideas about femininity as, you know, collective and giving and caring and, and wonderful is that in our cultures we punish women who aren't, right? So that, that, <laughs> that women who step out of that in, uh, uh, you know, American sociology is called backlash. And there are many, many studies that show that aggressive, assertive, ambitious women um, are burned at the stake uh, in social situations. And um, we don't want that. We want the, exactly what Ricoeur is saying, that the assumption of taking freedom is also granting the freedom to the other. We have not done that for women. And I can tell you, in, uh, it's not ha it's not, hasn't happened in Europe either. Uh, and if you look at the last US election, you see what happens to a woman who has the chutzpah, as we say in New York, uh, to, I mean, you can't run for president without being ambitious. Right, ambitious women are still uh, figuratively burned at the stake. Look what happened to S Simone de Beauvoir. Uh, you go back, you look at how her work was denigrated, how she was attacked, um, how work that was clearly original to her was credited to Sartre. You know, these are there are multiple crimes of habitus, and they have to be addressed Elinor, and answered. You want to <laughs> yes, on this? just to rebound on this. Um, so that's a part of the problem, right? But the other part is that men are taught also that they are independent, that they don't have to uh, be grateful for the care they receive because they, they just deserve it. Um, and so it's, it's broader than the issue of women, right? It's yes. the issue of how we envision um, political relations, economical relation, law. So as I said, there's Ricoeur, there's a host of uh, feminist philosophers who use uh, care as a way to even rethink uh, global ethics, like how countries <coughs> should interact with one another. So I think that the idea of relationality as, as maybe an alternative to liberalism and its crazy idea that we are autonomous, um, is it can, can penetrate all fields of knowledge. And there's also, for example, a, a legal scholar, uh, Jennifer Nedelsky, who we invited here a couple of years ago. And she's, she's um, taking apart law, American law, and showing how law makes you believe that you are an individual, and so you have rights, and that these rights are granted upon you as an individual, and you know your property is private, it's yours. Where did that come from? I mean, <laughs> um, so, so, and she tries to provide an alternative model that she calls relational law, where law could structure relations. Some relations make you autonomous. So there's no, there's no uh, contradiction between autonomy and relation. You just have yeah. to acknowledge that some relation makes you autonomous. And a great example is yeah. parent-child relations. That's you know, hard. what is the ambition of that, to make that child autonomous at some point. Uh, <laughs> please. Um, so, so some relation makes us autonomous. And, and if we go back maybe to the question of, of knowledge and how we produce knowledge, it's true that the academia was founded, like the idea of academia as embedded in the, you know, in the campus outside of town where thinker would think, uh, is also based on the idea of the autonomy of the scholar. Right? So we have freedom to think, and we are supposed to be autonomous from pressure, political pressure, financial pressure. So, so there is a set of relations that protects our autonomy so that we can think. However, in neoliberal academia, this is being eroded in many, many ways. And, and I think there is a connection between this and what you describe uh, in the book, which is the other spe specialization of knowledge. Yeah. So what is the way out of this? <laughs> Please. <laughs> Well, but I think, you know, dependence is a, an essential uh, question here, right? So that um, 
if, uh, you know, women in general, because of the way things are organized, are much more comfortable with the idea of dependency. And uh, men are far less comfortable um, because it's, 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 it's frightening. And, and it, uh, you know, I think goes back to these very early attachments and early dependency that because of the way the culture is organized, you want to get out of as quickly as possible. And of course, we all want to become autonomous eventually. Nobody wants their, you know, 32-year-old kid <laughs> hanging around your knees. You know, this is not, not the ideal. Um, but I, I, I think that making these um, presuppositions, it's the same with uh, assumptions or presumptions or paradigms in every discipline. If you talk about it, if you put them on the table, it is much easier to discuss it. I find in a lot of interdisciplinary uh, meetings, nobody addresses epistemology. Nobody says, this is how we're starting our work. Now you are probably you may be starting in a different way, but let's put the epistemology on the table and then let us respect those differences because we have to acknowledge that um, interesting findings or ideas can come from various uh, and different paradigms, but they can help us think. I think Francesco wanted to make a point about the historical part of your work, which is very important. Yes, the, I think it's important book. just to underline that the, 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 the important part of history of science in your in your work. And it, it's really interesting because, so you quote um, Vico, of course, your, your, your love, Vico, uh, Cavendish, uh, etc., and also epigenetics. And uh, it's interesting to see that there is a, a, a huge history and maybe an unknown history of organic memory. And before DNA, okay, a lot of authors and also experiments have been made on organic me memory, so the, the, the link between biologies and biographies. Okay. And so my, my point is, and in, in, the, same, in, in the same time, you, you, you criticize uh, really uh, uh, accurately, I would say, the mechanicism. And my, my, my question is, do, do, you, uh, do you not have the impression that we, we lived in the history of science a kind of parenthesis? between, you know, uh, nature philosophy yeah. and epigenetics, and this uh, mechanicist parenthesis is, uh, is closing now. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, as so <laughs> as I said, no, but as I said um, uh, last night, uh, the reason, one of the reasons that mechanistic thinking has survived is that there are many successes attached to the idea of mechanism. Uh, so there is a good example of uh, fruitful, as a fruitful but fraught uh, idea. Um, but I do think that maybe collectively uh, these disciplines, there, something has happened. We have reached some wall. And, you know, computational theory of mind is just one example where, you know, it has to be replaced by, I think, the idea of feeling organisms <laughs> and not, um, you know, uh, uh, symbolic systems theory, which is reserved only for, you know, humankind. And then you get this really strong neo-Cartesian aspect um, of thinking. So... Yeah, I think it's optimistic, but I, th I think you're right. And epigenetics is creating a lot of hoopla. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as I mentioned also in, in the philosophy of biology, these very interesting things about what is an individual, what is agency, how do we think about these questions. And, of course, they go, they go all the way up from a single cell to a, a, a human organism. Yes, don't, yes. Don't, don't you think that, one, you know, the, the, the fact, as you say, that the view of the dogma, DNA, yeah. RNA, protein, yeah. was simplistic, very efficient, but simplistic, and that now it's more complex. Yeah. But it's something very old. Pascal said, 
that there were things that were causes and caused. That yeah. you have retroactive uh, 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 loops of yeah. causality. Yeah. It's something which in mathematics and physics is a very old idea. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something which biology, <laughs> maybe because of a fascination with, with the results, the, the, the question I think is not, uh, at least the question so much that the mechanistic way is a, is a dead end, that the way biology has thought about mechanism is very poor if you compare it with physics. I mean, in relativity, uh, in quantic mechanics, it's not mechanism like you go from here with an arrow here. No. It's, it's very complex. Ordered chaos is, is something complex. So I think there has been a fascination or a tendency of finding shortcuts <coughs> in biology and thinking that biology is something special because living beings are something special. And not, I, I would say, not having the depths in the scientific uh, uh, that other science, which are older. Biology is a new science. Absolutely. Physics in, is an old yes. science. Physics is an old science, but as we say, I mean, there was the quantum crisis in a way, and we still have general relativity and quantum and, you know, ne'er the between do meet. It's like mind and body. It's, it's good. like mind it and makes, body. It makes science but work. But also <laughs> what fascinates me, and believe me, I mean, I, I cannot do the mathematics here. I'm not an expert on physics. I, I, I I think I know a lot more about biology, um, but uh, the uses of mathematics and physics are famously good, right? The application of mathematics and biology has been terribly fraught. And when people are working at whatever level in biology, the tendency is to move in that other direction, say from the central dogma, you know, DNA to RNA to proteins, to something immensely more complicated. So the more people know in biology, the more complicated it gets. Whereas the ideal in physics is to have that beautiful uh, reductive formula that nevertheless works. I mean, we know that it has an application to the natural world that is real. Uh, in biology, perhaps because people are looking at these, you know, <laughs> wet, slimy, gooey things, uh, it, it just it doesn't work out. And also because the history of biology has been resistant to uh, physicists uh, and mathematicians interfering, even though someone like Turing, uh, you know, did beautiful things, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Now I think it's time to give the floor to the audience. So you peut poser vos questions en français, il n'y a aucun problème. So I think there is someone in Yes, you can. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. My name is Sonia. Um, I would be, I mean, it's a very big question. I'm not sure I can even ask. We're here now. for big ones, I think. <laughs> we're not shy today. Okay, great. It's Perfect. just like we're throwing it all out, so go for it. <laughs> So my question is, um, as human beings, you know, being in this species, um, it sometimes seems like, you know, the mind... First question is that, are we only humans the ones to have a mind? Or do we consider that also animals, such as like maybe orcals or whales or dolphins, also have this kind of capacity? I'm aware, I think, that they have this like very emotional um, awareness, right? and interconnectivity between them. So first, are we the only ones to have a mind and that consciousness? And sometimes the big question is, is this um, a blessing or is this like, as if are we, are we, are we chosen or are we cursed? So that is the question. Like there, the are there are a lot of people, I mean, I think this idea that consciousness is reserved for human beings is a neo-Cartesian, another fantasy. I mean, uh, we have relations with animals, many of us, and um, you know there's a distinction in phenomenology that's made now rather routinely, which is you know pre 
reflective self-consciousness and reflective self-consciousness, which is knowing that you know. Um, it seems that there are also qu uh, quite a few animals that know that they know. Uh, so, you know, that's not just people and, ev you know, everybody else out there. So, uh, and I think this is really changing. Right? Can, yeah. can I, I would formulate your question in another way. <laughs> Do dolphins think they are the only conscious animal on Earth? <laughs> Or do they know we are also <laughs> conscious? We don't know that, right? <laughs> no, so, so, and is it a curse? Uh, forms of self-consciousness, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot, many, many animals that have mirror self-recognition. Many, many birds, elephants. And in fact, I have a feeling it's just going to grow and grow because every time they test, every day you read a new paper, Pigeons, now pigeons. Uh, so, so, so I think this is going to grow. And then you have to ask yourself, so what does that mean? You know, my dog did not recognize himself in the mirror. I, I love my dog. He was emotionally uh, brilliant animal uh, when he was alive. So then we have to, again, think through those hierarchies. Um, and as I said, you know, bacteria can do amazing things, uh, create morphologies together have an extraordinary collective life, but even alone. So, um, you know, we have to reimagine our hubris, I think. And the, the interesting thing, ju just to finish on this, is when people thought that animals could not recognize a self-image in a mirror, it took a very long time before some scientists said chimpanzee can do it. And then everybody said it's very surprising, but okay, they are our closest cousin mm -hmm. in yes. terms of evolution. That's it. That's so it. it makes sense. Yeah. And then it took time to see that <laughs> elephants also and dolphin. And when when the 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 <laughs> the, the, the how to say the bird came, yes. everybody was surprised. But the nice thing, you say it goes faster and faster. You, you spoke does, about yeah. imagination. <laughs> you don't find results when you think they are impossible. So you don't make the test because they say, yeah. the test failed. It's complicated to make a test. So you say the test failed. OK, it confirms what I thought. It's a negative result, which I knew that a bird cannot see itself in a mirror. The test didn't work. It's normal. So you have to think it is possible to do the test in a way, and it's difficult, that you will find a result. So the more you think, people think, scientists think, that humans are unique, the less they see reflection similarities in the animals. Right. The more they think it's possible that animals are similar to us, and the more they find it. So it's really yeah. also an emotional and... And, and, and also there's view. some stuff with animals and emotions. My. Uh, uh, now deceased friend Jak Panksepp, who you me mentioned before, spent his entire career telling other scientists that other mammals have emotions. And it was, he was pushed into a corner. He was isolated. Of course, it made him a little angry. He was a, a very feisty guy. But, um, uh, you know, before he died, fortunately, the tide had, had changed. But, you know, it's like a sinusoid because Darwin made a book about emotion a in animals and men. A wonderful book. And it wasn't forgotten, like, you know, like it was an aspect that we don't like. But let's say <laughs> we are primates, and primates are visual animals, so we are yeah. obsessed with mirrors. Mm -hmm. But for a dog, for a dog, the world is what is, what it's the odor. And so the question for a dog would be, does he recognize his own odor and not does he recognize his image in a mirror? So it's, exactly. it's you know, so we are yeah. asking questions from an anthropomorphic point of view instead of trying to, you know, to go in the mind of the animal and ask what, you know, what, what, what test could be made that is relevant to the animal and not about us. So a lot of our research about animals speaks about us and not about the animals. Yeah, Vincent Desprez would say we have to put into force experiments which are interesting for the animals. Yes. We have to interest them to what we ask. Well, otherwise, we get bullshit. 
I will try to speak in English. Uh, it was a, a shock for me to know that uh, there are more bacteria uh, in my uh, body than my own cells. Yeah. And uh, uh, after this day, I can only say uh, we are hungry. Uh, we are uh, <laughs> in love. <laughs> what, what do you think about that? Yeah. Oh, the microbiome. This is another... Uh, tremendously interesting uh, um, you know avenue of thinking and again thinking about you know what is us what is not us um, where do we draw the lines as we were saying before what are the barriers because this is I mean I was fascinated to listen to the discussion about um, uh, viruses another whoa world and you know viruses are dead and alive it's uh, to think about that but that we need this bacteria if we don't have it we don't exist uh, I think a lot more is being done and it might uh, you know conceptions of what we are are usually trail discoveries in say, science, even among scientists, right? They stumble on this extraordinary material, but we're conservative uh, beings. I think we are. And we, you know, we have a tendency, our, you know, expectation is the better part of perception, right? So, and, you know, there's that Friston model that I keep reading about and worrying over, um, but it's that... It seems that the organ of the brain is really a predictive organ. It predicts on the basis of past experience, which is also interesting for feminism, um, and that uh, we clamp down the unexpected. So you have to be really surprised, really, really surprised to reconfigure your uh, uh, perceptions of the world. But I think the microbiome, some discoveries in epigenetics, all of this is at least slowly going to reform our perceptions because we'll have to do it. And it's just, just one point. We don't, we thought there, was mo there were more bacteria than it's our not true. cell. <laughs> we have oh, dozens of it. thousands. Okay. <laughs> of billions of cells. In fact, the last count is we have as many bacteria as cells. Okay, so good. It's like That's okay. Good to it's know. Thank you, God. <laughs> it's a quality. But the, I was with you. I thought it was the other but, way But around. the interesting so, thing is, and you're right with, you know, how much do you need to change course? Yeah. It's more than 60 years that work has shown in immunology that when mice didn't have bacteria in their gut, you, you raise them in sterile, sterile conditions. Their immune system didn't work. They were not right. able to reject infection. So it was known that a microbiote is essential for at least one vital function. But it stayed like this. OK, it's essential for the immune system. And let's go. And to think <laughs> that it's an essential part of us and of our life, it, it took something more. So sometimes you know, but it's not enough to know that something is important, and to make it a central uh, uh, subject of research. And, yeah. and the question is, what, what is needed from knowing that something exists and that it's important to make it a real subject of research and not just a, a, a subject of knowledge? You know, we know yeah. that. But it's also sociology. I have uh, these yeah. sociological people on my right who, where you some form of collectivity is very important for ideas, yeah. right? And, and that, you know, all those many, many studies about people who watch a movie and then they're um, told when they, you know, they call them back, they've answered things very accurately, they call them back and they give the same answers and then they say, but you know, everybody in your group said this. <laughs> and the people are sent away again. And when they're called back, 
and they ask what happened in the film, they remember the wrong answer. This is pretty deep. <laughs> Une autre question. Oui. Uh, hi, thank you for being here today. Um, I come from uh, a master's of English right now, and I think you were a master's of English once, no? I have, I have a PhD in English. Right. Yeah. Um, and my question is, I read your book uh, last year, The Delusions of Certainty, and as much as I was totally with you and I agreed with you and... I found this uh, power of I doubt. I can hear the butt coming. Yeah. Just get to I'm the butt. I'm coming, yeah. No, how do you, <laughs> how do you make <laughs> doubt into something that isn't as destabilizing as it was for me when I finished your book? I thought doubt is such a great force to put things into question. But what do you believe in the end? Right. You know, it was interesting because when I did uh, interviews for, for that book in, in France, everybody grabbed onto the doubt thing. You know, I think they, you know, got through the book and then they get to the doubt and they go, oh, yeah, she thinks doubt is really cool. Um, my, and I, I, I kept saying to these journalists, I said, I am not talking about total fog as, you know, as a good thing. Uh, you know, I am not saying that we should just, you know, walk around in some big haze and this is going to, you know, help our intellectual progress, uh, which some people seem to believe I was saying. Uh, no. So what I am saying is that there are some of these metaphysical questions that do s appear to go on and on uh, and have been answered in a number of different ways and that there are many perspectives from which we can look at a big problem, a big question. If you adopt multiple perspectives, you have to really know them. I mean, I'm not talking about, you know, ignorance as a position to occupy as a position of glory. I, I am talking about uh, really knowing various epistemological positions from which you can generously, generously occupy, move around, say, from uh, a neuroscientific position to a psychoanalytic position to a sociological position, et cetera, genomic position, and you will ask the same question and you will get different answers. But out of that, those multiple answers, you will get what I call a focused zone of ambiguity. <laughs> <laughs> But it's focused, you know? It's not just fuzz, right? So in that focused zone of ambiguity, I think you will find a better next question than if you're only in a ditch moving forward in a single discipline that often can lead to dead ends. Doubt as something <laughs> focused. <laughs> But it's, it's really fundamental to, to, to the very notion of research, right? Which means asking the question of what we ignore is the most fundamental question. What we think we know is knowledge. Research is trying to see what we ignore. Uh, 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 Nicolas de Cusa, uh, uh, a humanist in the, in the 15th century, wrote a very beautiful book, which is called Learned Ignorance. Savant, comment on dit? Docte ignorance. La docte ignorance. And I think to be, I mean, to be a learned ignorant, which means to try to see, to understand what we ignore and what, what may be important things we ignore, to try to find them, is the basis of research and is the opposite of ignorance. Yeah. And, and this exactly. is the positive side of doubt. Right? Yeah, and Question. ignorance is not the same as ignoramus, <laughs> right? The, 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 the sort of, we have this in America now, belligerent uh, 
uh, unknowing. Right. But you, I mean, in order to be a learned ignorant, you need to confront your yes. ignorance, right? Yeah. Which means you need to interact with people who do not think like you, yes. right? Which is not what we do most of the time in academia. <laughs> we, we do it, so, so, we no, do it in one field, which, mm. which I practice for, for some time, which is ethics reflection. Yeah. Mm. Because ethics, we yeah. think, and it's interesting, mm. we think that it's only by crossing different Mm -hmm. uh, uh, views yep. that we can go beyond these views mm -hmm. and and try to see where the important questions are. Why maybe is it now in the in the in the world used in this in this kind of ethic reflection? Because it it's how do we apply knowledge mm -hmm. and invention to the respect of everybody's <laughs> of, of people's right? And so it's so to be so serious that knowledge should be put at the disposition of the people, and so knowledge should be crossed, because it's not the question whether this kind of knowledge. Mm. In scientific research, it's much harder, because mm. to do this, you have to have humility, as mm. you said. Mm. You have to have pride. What I'm doing is very important. It's the reason why I contribute. But you have to be humble and thinking mm. that what others will bring from a different perspective is as important or more important <laughs> That what you bring, and then you build something. Uh, in, in ethics, I found that the most beautiful thing we could do was to come with a question or an answer that no one at the beginning mm -hmm. had in his mind. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. like transdisciplinary collective intelligence. But my experience as yours in research mm -hmm. is that it's very difficult because you always want in a discipline that the other discipline works for you. <laughs> and not working with the discipline, you know? So it's, so it's master and servant, yes. and it's not, it's not working. And, and to have this learned ignorance, mm -hmm. you, you have to have humility. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so it's and, you know, in, intellectual humility, which is, you know, not the same as, as you said, not being proud of what you're doing, not being, you know, apologizing for your work. I mean, I see this in a lot of women mm -hmm. at conferences that before they've even started their paper, they've apologized for being there. And, <laughs> and they're so, you know, so, so grateful. And I always want to say, no, 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 no. Uh, uh, don't do that. But, you know, real intellectual humility is understanding the limitations of any given epistemology and saying, gee... Someone is going to give me something at, at this table. You know, it's a kind of hunger, too. You know, you're going to give me a, a, a text that could change what I'm thinking. It's invaluable. So we have another question. Yeah. Does yes, there? thank you. Uh, thank you so much. This is so wonderful. I wish we had all day for the discussion. Uh, I'm struggling with the question of mind and matter. Is mind just a consequence of structure or structure and matter? And uh, uh, of course, I have no idea. Uh, but uh, th th there are two, two uh, indicators that, that, in, that, that uh, uh, well, should put the balance more to, to, towards structure, structure only. Uh, why should uh, carbon and nitrogen and oxygen be special in any way? I, I can admit it for hydrogen, uh, hydrogen but, but for the heavy atoms, there's no, no real reason. And this, the second thing, much of what shapes our mind uh, has very different materials, like, say, reading a book. Uh, so what, what, what yeah. do you... Th could, could we imagine mind just being shaped by structure? Yeah, I think that emergence is very much... Are making that argument, emergent theory, systems theories, for example, all of this uh, is essentially making that argument. Because if you are trying to marry physics and biology, and not everybody wants to do it, there are arguments that, um, you know, that that's wrong. But, of course, logically, it's what makes sense. Uh, and that structure somehow produces what we think of as consciousness. So those arguments about the nervous system are uh, relating consciousness to feeling, which is a structural argument. 
right? That with the nervous system, something seems to, uh, uh, the structure seems to change to create feeling states, which then are related to consciousness. Um, it's, again, it's an argument. We don't know that that's the case. But what you are saying fits beautifully with that idea. And, and just one, uh, the part of your question when you say, why, why carbon and nitrogen and, okay, it's a very big question because it's, do you have to use them for people which, mean, which make synthetic biology, biology de synthèse? It's very important to know if you need these ingredients to see the emergence of life. For people which make exobiology, looking for life in other planets. It's very important. If I see carbon, does it mean it's an important building block? We don't know because of the contingency of history. Is it because carbon and nitrogen have some particularities, uh, properties that favor the emergence of what we call living things? Or is it just that the history of the emergence of life on Earth has happened with these atoms and not yeah. other, but could have happened in other conditions yeah. with other, and we don't know the answer. Yeah. Yeah. Oui. Merci. En, en français, qu'est-ce qui fait qu'on n'a pratiquement pas de souvenir de notre toute petite enfance, de notre naissance You don't, no one knows this, this thing either, but it's absolutely fascinating. Um, there have been some theories that the hippocampus, which is like the little worm-like uh, part, a uh, little structure in the brain that you can see, it's quite distinct, um, is not developed. At the same time, we all know that the three-year-old can tell us what happened, you know, last Sunday, uh, and and remembers until continuous memory really does not begin until about you know five or six when you look back that you can relate memories and then uh, you know the complexity uh, of this question also I think involves the development of language to what degree you know three year olds speak just fine most of them right so but uh, uh, what does that have to do with our ability to have autobiographical memories that are often, you know, there's no engram in the brain. We're not getting original memories ever, except possibly some motor sensory memories that are, you know, probably stored in different ways. Um, do you, you have a little there is, there thought? Is one, there is one... <laughs> There is one reductionist and, and very fascinating answer that was published in, I think, two years ago in Science uh, by, by a neuroscientist. Uh, the thing is, you know, the hippocampus, and you said it yesterday, is the only part apparently in our brain, not in, in, in rodent's brain, where new cells are generated during all our life. Uh, and the question is, which is a fascinating question, how do you keep memory in an organ where cells die and are replaced by other cells. Yeah. So how can I remember <laughs> what happened when I was 10 years old, knowing that no cell from this time is remaining? So it means that the memory is once again in the connection and the activity of the cell and not in the existence yeah. of the cell. The first point. Now there has been findings that show that when you enhance the production of cells in the hippocampus, which you can do in mice, yeah. just by making a stimulating environment. If, right. if the environment is changing, the mice produce more cell and the memory is, is better. If the environment is always the same, there is less cell production. And you can do it artificially with uh, 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 genetic uh, uh, approaches and you, you make the cell being more produced or less produced. Yeah. Now the finding was that when you produce a lot, when mice produce a lot of cells in their hippocampus, they learn, much, they remember much easier, much more things that they lived since the production of the cell, and they retain less older memories. At least right. they, they have more difficulties to mobilize them. When they produce few cells, they have problems, like in Alzheimer, yeah. to to uh, uh, engrade 
to, to accumulate new memories, but they keep yeah. very well the memories. Now they looked in mice what happens in newborn, and the development is much, uh, rap yeah, much yeah, more yeah. rapid than in humans. So and they saw that there is a very big production of hippocampus cells. There is a very big production of cells in the brain w in newborns and in young uh, children. And they saw that if they, do, if they did the same production in the hippocampus of adult mice, they got amnesia of former uh, 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 memories and a very good capacity to engrange new memories. So the, right. the deduction was we make too much. It's a hypothesis. We are not mice, and it's, uh, <laughs> but we are making so many cells that we learn and we forget, and we learn, and implicit learning remains. Yeah. We learn to speak, but we don't remember how we learn to we, we, we don't have memories of learning to speak, right? Which is nice, by the way, because, by the way, we, we don't remember that the language we speak is a language that at the beginning was completely foreign to us. We think it's us. Yeah. We, we forget <laughs> that there was one time when it was not us. So there are, you know, there are hypotheses yeah. Yeah. that too much of a good thing, which been producing a lot of hippocampus cells, might, you know, might, be, uh, <laughs> might be an inconvenient to keeping memory. Not to learning implicitly, but to, to keeping uh, the clarity. Too much of a good thing has also <laughs> negative consequences. Exactly, so proprioceptive memory, you know, how you move, yeah. this is not an issue, right? This is really about that other level. Yeah. It's, like, it's like when we are very young, we learn a lot, and maybe we learn all the more that we don't learn consciously, that, that we don't right. remember right. that we learn. Right. So it becomes right. a second nature. Yeah. Well, I, I think I'm afraid it's time to to stop this talk, uh, we could have been talking uh, all, the, all day with, uh, with the <laughs> Into panel. Into the night, and people would have been dropping off their yeah. chairs. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we, we would like just to, to, to take the privilege with Francesco to ask you a last question, which is related oh. to, the, okay. to the memory and the, the way. Yeah. yeah, so it will be the, the last question. Maybe just the context first. Uh, in her wonderful lecture, we, we wrote this, this okay. question. In, uh, in uh, Sirius Welt wonderful lecture last night, she explored, uh, she explored the question of in the intimate links between imagination, memory, and space. And uh, uh, Sirius Welt wondered why these links between uh, memory, uh, imagination, and space were so obvious, for example, for in, in the art of memory tradition, and uh, why these links uh, were so difficult or are still so difficult to grasp for neuroscientists today deeply trapped uh, into their monodirectional field. And at that occasion, you said, uh, if uh, interdisciplinary studies of one sort or another are popular these, day, these days, it is also true, in my experience, you said, that these collaborations are often less than successful. Okay, <laughs> therefore, there is our question, Siri. Let us propose you an exercise of imagination. We give you all the keys of our university <laughs> and all the resources you need. The question is, what would you do to transform the roots fields of science in an harmonious landscape where it will be easier and more desirable to look to the left and to the right. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about this because you go to these conferences and you have people from all sorts of different disciplines and everyone gives a paper and then there are questions, et cetera, et cetera. And you realize that, I mean, I've realized a lot of times that, you know, nobody is really listening properly <laughs> to the other people. So I, I think, for example, if you asked every participant to do a little assignment, which is to write down some certainties that you know, he or she is bringing from the field, that that is, of course, a philosophical exercise in itself. But people who want to participate would then be asked for a kind of introspection about their own discipline um, that might be really interesting. And just to say, 
I was once on a very small panel. It was uh, organized um, by a neurologist, and there was a philosopher. I was there, you know, the novelist, weird person, and um, then there was a neuroscientist, and the topic was repetition. There were maybe six people at the table, and it was fascinating. It really worked. So sometimes this works, and I remember walking out with the philosopher, and I had... Uh, mentioned Kierkegaard's Repetition, which is a, a diabolical book about repetition. And I said, you know, every time I read it, it's different. <laughs> and he said, me too. <laughs> and I remember, you know, that, and, and I, I, I remember I made an error, and the neuroscientist said, Siri, that's wrong. And I said, oh, tell me, you know, please correct me. But it was that small enough and open enough to produce results for me that I remembered and took away, and I think there were other people there too. But maybe just presenting your, a list, say, of like a, a four uh, uh, premises from which you proceed, how you do your work, sharing those and making them clear might be really helpful. Mostly they're just hidden. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it might be like a little assignment. You know, you can't come to our conference unless you bring your four answers. Well, thank you very much for the very <laughs> experimental answer. We'll try to do it. Uh, I think now I, I will just, uh, je vais repasser en français pour vous donner quelques informations pour la suite qui va être, qui va être très courte. D'abord, j'aimerais remercier euh, celles et ceux qui ont permis d'organiser cette rencontre, en particulier l'équipe d'Unibat, l'équipe d'Unicep, l'équipe d'Unicom, et en particulier Angélique Bachelor euh, et Diego Salvador. Puis remercier aussi la Fondation Charles Veillon, euh, Élise David en particulier, et bien sûr euh, aussi Cyril Veillon qui préside le, le conseil de fondation. Euh, vous signalez que pour ceux et celles qui n'auraient pas eu la chance d'assister hier à la conférence de Siri, elle sera disponible sur le web à travers le site de la Fondation Charles Veillon et le site de l'UNIL, donc vous pourrez voir sa, sa conférence d'hier. Et puis, euh, vous dire également qu'il y a un café et des milliardistes qui vous attendent à l'extérieur, qu'il y aura un stand pour consacrer la dédicace des livres de Syrie, en compagnie de Anna, notre traductrice, qui pourra aussi vous permettre de dialoguer avec elle si vous ne parlez pas anglais. Et je crois que je n'ai rien oublié. Est-ce que j'ai oublié quelque chose non Alors, on va remercier très chaleureusement tous les participants et participants.